Good afternoon. I'm David Ferriero, the Archivist of the United States, and it's a pleasure to welcome you here to the William G. McGowan Theater at the National Archives, and a special welcome to those of you who are joining us on the National Archives YouTube channel. Today we present a discussion of a new book, Free Speech and Unfree News, The Paradox of Press Freedom in America, by Sam Levovic of George Mason University. Professor Levovic's book comes at an interesting time, an election year the likes of which we haven't seen in decades. And it's election year with a spotlight on those who are reporting on it for the public, the news gatherers for print broadcast and the internet. Today's program is presented in conjunction with our exhibit, Amending America, on display upstairs in the Lawrence F. O'Brien Gallery. This exhibit features more than 50 original documents from the National Archives that highlight a remarkably American story, how we amend our Constitution. I hope you'll take time after the program to view the exhibit in the O'Brien Gallery before you leave, and don't forget to stop in the rotunda and examine the original Charters of Freedom, the Declaration, the Constitution, and the Bill of Rights. Before we get to today's program, I'd like to tell you about some upcoming programs here in the McGowan Theater. This Thursday, April 7th at noon, author James Traub will speak on his most recent book, John Quincy Adams, Militant Spirit. Traub draws on Adams' diary letters and writings to evoke a diplomat and president whose ideas remain with us today. And a book signing will follow the program. On Wednesday, April 13th at 7 p.m., we'll present a panel discussion, African American Life in Washington, D.C., before emancipation, that will explore life before the 1862 Congressional Emancipation Act and discuss the slavery and freedom exhibit at the Smithsonian's new National Museum of African American History and Culture. This program is presented in partnership with that museum, the DC Commission on African American Affairs, and the DC Commission on Emancipation. If you want to learn more about these and all of our programs and exhibits, consult our monthly calendar of events. There are copies in the lobby as well as a sign-up sheet where you can receive it by regular mail or email. You'll also find brochures about other National Archives programs and activities. And becoming a member of the National Archives Foundation is another way to get more involved in the National Archives. The Foundation supports all of our education and outreach activities, and there are applications for membership also in the lobby. And a little known secret that I keep telling everyone, no one has ever gotten turned down for membership in the Foundation. P Professor Levick is assistant professor of history at George Mason University. He received his bachelor's degree from the University of Sydney in his native Australia and his doctorate at the University of Chicago. Before coming to George Mason, he held postdoctoral fellowships at Rutgers University and New York University. His published articles on the role of the media in the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, on the history of the Fulbright program, on the politics of pop culture in the 1940s, and on the Beatles and cultural globalization. He currently serves as associate editor of the Journal of Social History. Please welcome Sam Levick to our stage. Uh, thanks, David, and uh, thanks all for coming out on what turned out to be quite a nice uh, Monday in the end, despite predictions. Um, it's a real pleasure uh, and a real honor to be giving a talk here. That's the first talk I've given since the book was published uh, last month. Uh, and it's really fitting for two reasons. First, I spent a lot of time uh, with the holdings of the National Archives in the business end uh, doing the research for the book, so it's nice to come back to the public-facing side of the institution. Um, and secondly, the book's an effort to make sense of what the right to a free press uh, meant during the 20th century and could have meant during the 20th century. And so it's a real privilege to be giving this talk uh, associated with a an exhibition celebrating the uh, 225th anniversary of the passage of the Bill of Rights uh, in 1791. Uh, so what I want to do today is just sketch the broad argument of the book uh, and give you a few examples of what I talk about and uh, hopefully use it uh, as an example as well to think about how we might think about the history of uh, the amendments in the 20th century, right? how the amendments evolve or don't evolve and how we should talk about that history. Um, so when I began the book, I was really began struck by what seemed to me a central paradox of press freedom uh, in the early 21st century. And it was on the one hand, the right to free speech or the right to publish without government interference has never been more highly protected 
than it is today. Right? The Supreme Court has upheld the right to publish all sorts of information uh, absent government censorship. Uh, and that right is even extended to things that some people are slightly puzzled about, right? The right to make uh, corporate contributions to campaigns, for instance, is seen as a form of free speech. So that should mean that the free press is doing great, right? On the other hand, at the same time as the right to a free press has never been more highly protected, uh, the actual press seems to be beset by a sequence of crises. And two in particular struck me. Uh, the first was a crisis of access to government information and a crisis of access of publishing state secrets, which has manifested itself both in the war on whistleblowers over the last decade, uh, more leak prosecutions in the last 10 years than at any previous point in American history, um, and the sort of ongoing rise of classification. Right? Something like 80 million documents a year are currently being classified in the United States, which is sort of one problem uh, posed to the operations of the free press. Uh, the second is the economic crises of the newspaper industry in the wake of the internet. Right? The, uh, Closing of daily newspapers and the laying off of reporters uh, is a real crisis that you sort of see talked about a great deal in trade journals and more broadly. And I realized if I wanted to understand this crisis and this paradox, right, so the rise of free speech rights on the one hand and the crises of the actual press on the other, I'd need to make two moves in the book. Uh, the first would be to return to the middle decades of the 20th century. Uh, from roughly the 1920s through the 1970s. Because uh, it's in these decades that you actually see all of these trends have their origins. Uh, the first is the right to free speech has its origins in these years. Uh, now, as we know, right, the First Amendment to the Constitution is from the late 18th century. It says, Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of the press. Uh, but in practice, the Supreme Court doesn't really uphold a meaningful right to free speech or to publication uh, until the 1930s and after. Uh, during the 19th century, well, I mean, to begin with, we make a lot out of the fact that this is the First Amendment, right? This must mean something. Uh, it was actually originally intended to be the Third Amendment. Uh, the first two amendments in the late 18th century were supposed to deal with the election and compensation of Congress people, and they sort of slipped out of the drafting process. So what was the Third Amendment became the first, and has thereafter been embraced as sort of a quintessentially American value. Uh, but during the 19th century, everybody understands that there are going to be limits to what you have a right to say or publish and that the government does have the right to regulate speech so that speech that's not in the interests of the common good can be punished or censored. Uh, now, during the 19th century, the expectation is largely that will be done not by the federal government, right? the amendment says Congress shall make no law, but done by the state governments. So throughout the 19th century, the state governments pass all kinds of censorship legislation. Uh, in the first half of the 19th century, uh, blasphemy, obscenity, critiques of uh, government officials are illegal. Uh, Abolitionist material is illegal in the South prior to the Civil War. In the late 19th century, anarchist uh, literature is illegal. By the late 19th century, you don't have a right to circulate what's considered obscene material in the mail. Uh, and then that, what obscene material means in the late 19th century is basic birth control information. Uh, and then by World War I, this kind of repressive uh, impulse reaches a crescendo with the passage of the Espionage Act and Sedition Act, which make it illegal to criticize the war effort or the army, uh, the draft, and a host of other things, including the armies of the, uh, the uniforms of the army. Uh, they're very worried that people will make fun of the uniforms. Um, it's only after World War I that the Supreme Court begins to consider whether or not you might have a First Amendment right to say these kinds of things. Uh, and slowly, at first in dissent, and then building out to majority opinions through the 20s, 30s, and into the 50s, the Supreme Court will construct a far more robust First Amendment that protects the right to these kinds of speech from government censorship at both the federal and the state level. And for the press, the important case here is near versus Minnesota in 1931, uh, basically a small, uh, scurrilous, anti-Semitic newspaper in Minnesota uh, was censored, and it brought a free speech claim against uh, the mini, uh, Minnesota government, uh, which was upheld by the, it, its challenge was upheld by the Supreme Court. Right? So that the, uh, for the first time, the Supreme Court says uh, states can't censor newspapers. Um, and that will then kind of continue to expand throughout the 20th century. Uh, by the time in the interwar period that the Supreme Court begins to recognize a meaningful First Amendment right to speech or to publish without interference, the other two problems that I outlined are already beginning to emerge. Uh, the first of these is state secrecy which really balloons uh, in the late 1930s through to the 1950s with the construction of the modern classification system. Uh, and the second is the crisis of newspaper economics. Um, so in some sense, if we think that both the right to free speech and the politics of secrecy emerge a little later than we might imagine, um, the economic crises of the newspaper industry actually emerge earlier 
than we might imagine. Right? We think about them today as something that happens in the wake of the internet. Um, the largest number of newspapers in the nation's history was actually reached in 1909. Um, and it's been declining ever since, sometimes more quickly than other times. Um, but you actually get a steady process of decline in the number of newspapers in the nation from that period. And beginning in about the 1920s, you're going to get the first uh, sort of editorials and journalism pieces worrying about what's going to happen when the newspaper disappears, um, sort of very similar to the kinds of things that we see today. So that's the reason for going to the 1930s, 1940s and 1950s. Uh, and in looking in these decades, I realized I needed to make a second move as well to understand the paradox of press freedom. And that was to move the history from out, out to outside of the courts, uh, to look not just at Supreme Court jurisprudence about what the First Amendment means in law, but also to think about broader social, political, and economic conditions, what the right to a free press means in practice, and also what a wide variety of intellectuals, lawyers, politicians, publishers, and journalists thought a right to a free press should be or could be. Right? I think we tend to follow the history of the First Amendment by looking at the Supreme Court right? and to look at the ever rising tide of First Amendment speech rights. The traditional story here is quite an uplifting one, that over time more and more speech gets protected. And so by the end of the 20th century, the kind of founder's vision of a right to a free speech was for the first time fully realized and we had a great free marketplace of ideas in America. Um, looking at the broader debates in the mid-century uh, reveals a more complicated story. Uh, because I found there are actually two different visions of press freedom circulating in public discussion in these years. And the first is the one that's familiar to us. It's that a free press means absence of government censorship, right? the right to publish what you want without any government interference. And this was definitely circulating at the time. Uh, Raymond Clapper, the famous journalist, said in 1941, and I quote, uh, it's difficult for me to be dogmatic about this problem of the press, but I'm dogmatic on one point. There must be no government tampering with the news. I think the sort of defensive, backwards way that he expressed that, like I'm hard, it's hard for me to say anything about this, but the one thing I can say is I don't want government to censor, suggests that there were other visions of press freedom circulating. Uh, and those were varied and diffuse and complicated, but I think they all boiled down to one thing. They were an effort to guarantee or protect the forms of information that were circulating in the press. Right, a concern not just with the right to free speech and free publication, but to make sure that the press had a diversity of accurate quality information that it was providing to the public. Right, rather than a negative right to free expression, this was something like a positive right to the news. And the book traces this distinction back to the moment in 1919 when the Supreme Court begins to articulate the modern idea about a free press. Uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes in 1919 in dissent in Abrams obviously uh, says that we should have a free trade in ideas and that's the meaning of free speech. Uh, just months after he publishes that opinion, the journalist Walter Lippmann uh, writes a series of articles in The Atlantic in which he critiques that vision of free speech and a free press and says that actually if we focus on protecting opinions, uh, we'll be missing the point. He says that's to deal with, quote, a subsidiary phase of the whole matter. He thinks the more important point than protecting the right to express an opinion is to protect what he calls the stream of news upon which expression is based. Right? So rather than focus on people's right to say what they want, he's more concerned with how do people work out what they think about an issue. And that leads him to focus much more on the problems of the press and the economics of the press industry and the problems of government classification of information rather than censorship of speech. Uh, and the book opens with this distinction and then shows how a wide variety of Americans over the 20th century worked with the same distinction, right? trying to expand the meaning of press freedom to purify or improve or protect the stream of news upon which people base their opinions. And the book covers a wide variety of arenas in which this vision is debated. It looks at New Deal efforts to regulate the corporate news industry. It looks at efforts to improve the journalism, the labor of journalism, either by professionalization or the unionization of journalists. It looks at government publicity handouts and fears about government propaganda. It looks at efforts at the United Nations to write global press freedom laws that will uh, get rid of censorship and state propaganda internationally. It looks at the rise of state secrecy, freedom of information laws, and access regulations. Uh, and it looks at philosophical and political debates about what free the free press could actually mean in America. And across all of these settings, I show that there are always these two visions competing. Right? The vision that a free press should mean only the right to negative liberty, the right to publish without government interference, or the right to positive news, right? the idea that Americans should have some regulated access to good quality information. And in all of these settings, I show that this second vision loses out, right? that Americans continue to prioritize the right to free speech 
over any time the right to access to information. I think this produces the paradox that we live with today. So what I want to do then today is just very quickly sketch two of the problems uh, that confront press freedom in the 20th century. Uh, I want to look at the problem of corporate consolidation, and I want to look at the problem of state secrecy. And in each of these areas, I want to make three points. I just want to show you that there's a new problem in the 20th century that was unanticipated to the founders and unanticipated in the language of the First Amendment. I want to look at some efforts in the mid-20th century to construct a positive right to the news to counter these problems. And then I want to look at how that, those efforts failed. Right? And what's left is a right to free expression, but no effort to guarantee uh, access to the news. Okay, so problem number one, corporate consolidation of the newspaper industry. By the 1920s and increasingly by the 1930s, there's a widespread sense that this is a real problem and poses a foundational challenge to press freedom and American democracy. Uh, there are real structural reasons for thinking that the corporate consolidation of the press is a problem. As I said, the number of newspapers in the nation is declining in the first half of the 20th century, and that's being commented upon. Uh, there were something like 2,100 newspapers, daily newspapers in the nation in 1919, uh, that goes down to a little less than 1,800 by 1942. So that's a 14% decline in the number of newspapers in the nation, despite a 30% increase in the nation's population and a boom in circulation of those newspapers that exist. And those newspapers are increasingly monopolistic in their towns. Each town will increasingly only have one newspaper. In an earlier period, uh, New York has you know, uh, 50 newspapers in the late 19th century. Chicago has 12 in the early 20th century. Increasingly, these numbers will whittle down over the 20th century. Those newspapers that exist in each town are increasingly parts of chains. Uh, chain circulation makes up about a third of all circulation in the 1930s, about half of all circulation on Sundays. And these newspapers, monopolistic, consolidated in chains, are increasingly owned by newspaper barons, larger than life figures that sort of control what goes into the press and are, in the 1930s, increasingly reactionary political players. Uh, the key figure here is Randolph Hearst, right? sort of imagining him as the archetypal newspaper baron. Uh, in the political culture, there is a widespread sense that this is a problem, this is a threat, not least for the New Deal, uh, because these publishers are opposed to FDR and the New Deal. Uh, but also more broadly, because there's a debate about whether or not you can have a vibrant public, public sphere, vibrant public debate, if all of the organs of public opinion are owned by the same small set of individuals. And so you get uh, expressions of this anxiety and fear throughout the political culture of the Depression. And I just want to give you two examples to illustrate what's going on. Uh, the first is a debate between Harold Ickes, Secretary of the Interior, and Frank Gannett, uh, the head of the, newspaper, uh, the Gannett newspaper chain. They have a public debate in the New York Town Hall in 1939 that's broadcast nationally over NBC. And the subject of the debate is, quote, do we have a free press? Right? This is the, uh, the motion. And Gannett, right, high up in the New Deal administration, is arguing that America does not have a free press because the corporate ownership of the newspapers holds a financial whip that it uses to discipline and police the press. Um, it's sort of hard to imagine at any other point in American history a high level uh, administrative official arguing that there is no free press in America because the corporations are in control. Uh, but that's what Ickes is arguing in 1939. Gannett, unsurprisingly, doesn't agree, and he thinks the greatest threat to press freedom comes from the New Deal, which is going to try to regulate the newspapers. Uh, the other moment I draw your attention to is I think it's no accident that the masterpiece of cultural politics in these years is Citizen Kane, right? an effort to think about the undemocratic newspaper publisher that emerges out of these debates and in this moment, and in a moment when there are wide public boycotts of Hearst's newsreels and newspapers as an effort to protest what seemed to be Hearst's, uh, quote, incipient fascism is the language of the time. What you get in response to these fears then is an argument that something should be done about corporate consolidation. And as is typical of the New Dealers, they turn to the state to imagine efforts to use the state to regulate the newspaper industry. Uh, now, they're also concerned civil libertarians, so they don't want to do anything too bold. But they propose three uh, slightly technical uh, measures that are supposed to reform the newspaper industry, just like any other industry in the Depression. Uh, the first is the National Recovery Administration proposes that there should be a newspaper code that will regulate fair trade practices in the newspaper industry, an effort to try to make sure that large newspapers can't exploit their advantage in the marketplace to, to get rid of smaller newspapers. Uh, the second is a truth in advertising bill proposed by the uh, 
Food and Drug Administration that's an attempt to get rid of dangerous consumer advertising on the one hand, but is also understood by its proponents to be a way to limit the control of advertising interests over the newspaper economics and provide the readers with more of a say. And the third is an antitrust case against the Associated Press wire service. Uh, so in the 1930s, the Associated Press is basically a subscription-only service uh, that every, state, uh, every city will have one newspaper that subscribes to the Associated Press. It will then provide local news reporting for the members of the cooperative. Uh, if any new newspaper wants to buy into the AP wire service, existing members can veto their membership. So in 1941, uh, Marshall Field III wants to start a new newspaper in Chicago. He wants to support FDR. Uh, the AP subscription in Chicago is held by McCormick, right? very opposed to FDR and opposed to internationalism in foreign policy. And he vetoes Field's application. So Marshall Field can't buy a subscription to the AP wire service, which means that it's very hard for him to compete with McCormick because McCormick's getting all this news from all over the country at a cheap rate. Field would have to hire journalists in every state in the country to compete fairly. So he goes to the Justice Department and says, uh, this is an antitrust violation, and right? this is affecting my ability to compete. So none, none of these three measures are particularly bold or necessarily sexy on their face. Right? There's a fair trade practices regulation, anti-advertising regulation, and an antitrust action. Um, but all three are met with a firestorm of political controversy by the newspaper industry, who really make three arguments. First, they lobby behind closed doors, uh, putting pressure on Congress people. And in the archives upstairs here, I found letters uh, from newspapers to their local representatives suggesting uh, that if you pass these kinds of acts, um, I might need to support somebody else in the midterm next election. And then those Congress people will write to FDR and say, how about we wait on this one till later? Because uh, again, news politicians are dependent on their newspapers for coverage in these years. But secondly, they make two broader arguments related to the history of press freedom and the First Amendment. And these are made by a guy called Elisha Hansen, who's the general counsel for the American Newspaper Publishers Association, and the sort of individual that gets forgotten in histories of the First Amendment more generally, but plays an important role in driving its development over the 20th century. And he argues that first, if the government can regulate the economics of the newspaper industry, this will open the door to government interference with the editorial content of the newspaper industry, and that, that will therefore create a risk of dictatorial or totalitarian government in the United States. And second, he argues that state measures to regulate newspaper economics are violations of the First Amendment right to a free press. Right, that the First Amendment says Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of the press, and that these kinds of economic regulations are a form of abridgment. Uh, the New Dealers are kind of surprised by this. They say no one's ever suggested that the First Amendment provides the newspapers with an exemption from child labor laws, for instance, although the newspapers respond and say, yes, it does, actually. Uh, we'd like to be able to employ newsboy, uh, newspaper delivery boys, and they get an exemption from child labor law on this front. Um, but the, the publishers are insistent that if the government can regulate the economics of the newspaper industry, that will open the door to dictatorship. Uh, here's Hansen speaking about the Associated Press antitrust suit. If the suit succeeds, quote, the people of the United States will be confronted just as the people of Germany today are confronted with a government-controlled press. The public good requires that the press shall not be subject to such control, and our forefathers determined that question when they ratified the First Amendment. And this is actually quite a novel use of the First Amendment. It hasn't been used to protect newspaper industry prerogatives earlier in history. But Hansen successfully makes the case that the First Amendment requires a lack of government intervention in the newspaper industry. All three of these reform efforts fail. The NRA code is written behind closed doors in consultation with the NRA administrators and basically is a rubber stamp that exempts the newspaper industry from any formal regulation. Uh, NRA administrators at the time say it's highly unusual and by far the weakest code of any industry in the nation. The anti-advertising uh, anti bill is watered down in Congress and essentially amounts to not much by the time it passes out. Uh, the AP antitrust case is slightly more complicated uh, because the Justice Department actually wins the case and AP is forced to open its membership to anyone who wants to buy them. Um, but it does so on incredibly narrow grounds because it's afraid that any broad vision that the press can be regulated by the government will in fact violate the First Amendment. So what it says is that in this case, the newspapers have a right to buy from a wire service. But we probably think there's no broader right to bring antitrust actions against monopolistic newspapers in any given market. In other words, the newspaper publisher can bring an antitrust suit against one of its suppliers but the public can't bring any antitrust action against monopolistic newspapers on their behalf. And what you'll get then after World War II is really uh, neglect of antitrust action, even as press monopolization and consolidation 
uh, continues. And you can see this very clearly uh, in a commission into press freedom that was launched in the 1940s. Uh, Henry Luce, the publisher of Time Life, looks at these debates about press freedom and the state and thinks that everything's very confusing. And he wants to know what press freedom should actually mean in the 20th century. So he gives a chunk of change to the University of Chicago who bring in about uh, two dozen uh, leading intellectuals, liberal intellectuals, and lets them meet for five years to discuss what should a free press look like in the 20th century. And when you read the drafts of those meetings, at first, they're very in favor of the AP antitrust decision, and they want to expand it. And they think that if we could really use antitrust action to break apart chains, to break apart monopolies, we'll have a much more diverse newspaper market in America, and that'll be good for the readers. But over time, as they redraft and as they debate, they become very concerned that actually doing that would allow the state to regulate the newspaper industry and would create conditions of totalitarianism. And so in the end, they say, actually, we can't do anything to deal with corporate consolidation. We just need to leave it as is. That's one of the costs of a free press. And then they say, well, what should we do to deal with the fact that there are a declining number of voices in the marketplace of ideas? And their response is to say that any existing newspaper has a, quote, social responsibility to its readers. Uh, what does that mean in practice? It means that if you're the only newspaper in town, you have to publish the other side on any issue that you want. This is the birth of the modern idea about a fair and balanced media, okay? And it's a response to the decline of actual diversity in the newspaper market. It's a weak response to consolidation. Um, it's not by chance, right, that this is what leads to the rise of, say, the, rise of, say, the op-ed page in newspapers. The New York Times launches its op-ed page in the 1960s when its rival, the New York Herald Tribune, goes out of business. And in New York Times meetings, they say, well, there used to be a voice for liberal Republicans in New York. Now that's gone. We'll have to do it on the op-ed page. Right? So you get less newspapers and more voices within the newspapers as an attempt to deal with this problem uh, because earlier, more radical options were off the table. Uh, there's a small postscript to this story, which is that even though no one was using the antitrust actions in the 1940s, antitrust precedent in the 1940s, it's still on the books. And the newspaper industry is not very happy about that. Uh, in the 1960s, newspapers begin creating what they call joint operating agreements, where you have two newspapers in one town. They join the business and printing and advertising sections and then keep publishing two separate newspapers but with the same business, uh, business side of the operations. And the Justice Department begins to say that this is a violation of antitrust law and brings an antitrust suit in the mid-1960s. And the newspaper industry goes to Congress and asks for what it calls at first the Failing Newspaper Act, which then gets called the Newspaper Preservation Act, which is a formal exemption from antitrust laws to allow this kind of consolidation in order to preserve newspaper diversity. And they get it under the Nixon administration. And this is kind of the, the opening wedge of a broader wave of media deregulation in the 1980s and 1990s. Uh, interesting side note on this front. Uh, giving testimony to Congress in favor of the Newspaper Preservation Act is a guy called Arthur Hansen, who was Elisha Hansen's son, who'd inherited the family business representing the newspaper industry to Congress from the 1930s. So there's a kind of trajectory here from the 1930s through to the 1970s and onto the contemporary wave of deregulation. The outcome of all of this then is that there is no interference with newspaper economics out of fear that that will interfere with free speech. Newspapers are free to act, to publish what they want, to operate their businesses like they'd like. Um, and that's all understood as totally compatible with the First Amendment right to individual free speech. What comes alongside that, though, is a resignation to corporate consolidation of the newspaper industry. And a newspaper industry that by the 1980s and 1990s will be increasingly monopolistic, increasingly joined in chains, and geared to high profits. Right? Uh, as these newspapers take on debt, to buy their competitors and expand, they'll then have to service that debt and they'll owe money to stockholders. Uh, what they're basically doing is building on a house of sand. Uh, when the economics of the industry shift in the early 21st century, uh, we'll get the problems we get today where there have to be cuts to newsroom budgets uh, in order to meet the profit margins. It's also interesting, I think, as a broader story about who the right to a free press is supposed to protect. The traditional theory of press freedom that was developed in the late 18th century assumes that the press and the public have the same interests against the absolutist state. Right? We want to protect the right to free press against the state. By the 1930s and 1940s, it's less clear that, in fact, the press and the public have the same interests. People are worried that the economic rights of the press might run against the rights of the public to a diversity of newspapers. But an effort to build a meaningful First Amendment public right to the news fails. And what instead is continued to 
what's continue, what continues to be protected is the right of the publisher. Right? So by the 1960s, uh, A.J. Liebling, the press critic, sort of hits the nail on the head when he says that freedom of the press belongs only to those who own one. Right? And that's a direct legacy of the debates about what a free press should mean in the 1930s and 1940s. Okay, so that's problem number one. Right? Growing corporate consolidation, an effort to imagine state regulation, and a failure of that effort out of fears that it will interfere with the free newspaper market. Problem number two is the rise of state secrecy. Uh, now, we don't actually know how much information is kept secret in the United States after World War II. Right? That's part of what it means for something to be secret. Uh, but by any estimation, uh, it's a staggering amount. Right? Uh, philosopher of science Peter Gallison has estimated there are something like 7.5 billion pages currently classified in the American government, uh, which is the same amount of pages that are currently held on the shelves of the Library of Congress. And so there's sort of a second Library of Congress that's classified. Every year, something like 80 million documents are classified. 4.5 million Americans require a security clearance to do their work. And there's a massive edifice of state secrecy. As I said at the beginning, I think we tend to think of this as a timeless attribute of the state, sort of a holdover of a pre-democratic mode of governance. Uh, Max Weber, on the other hand, saw it as a modern form, right, something that all bureaucracies do. He said every bureaucracy will try to keep its information secret. Maybe that's true. Um, but there's also a very particular history about how you go about keeping things secret. Right? It's one thing to say you want to keep something secret. It's another thing to develop the laws and the practices and the mechanisms that will enforce that secrecy. And here the story is actually different. It's much newer. The origins of the modern secrecy regime come in the 1940s and 1950s. And you can see this if you go to World War II and a very obscure and forgotten government agency called the Security Advisory Board, which was established as part of the Office of War Information and whose job it was to go to all government departments for the first time and train them how to keep information secret. Uh, and as they go out throughout the federal government in the 1940s, they're amazed to find that federal employees have no idea how to keep things secret. So people are reading classified documents on streetcars. They're taking it down the road to get it photocopied at non-cleared uh, copying companies. They're bringing it home. Um, and there's sort of no real understanding about how you keep information secret. People are leaving it on their desks. They're not locking it up overnight. Uh, the reason for this is twofold. First, it's only during World War II, uh, in the late 1930s and then during World War II, that FDR first issues orders that all information across the federal government should be classified. Uh, and secondly, even during World War II, it turns out, there's actually no law on the books that makes it illegal to leak or spill a government secret. Right? It's just a kind of recommendation that this is something that should be kept secret. It's not backed up by law for reasons I could answer uh, in questions. It's a sort of a technical question about the bad way that the Espionage Act was written in 1917. Now, just because there's no way to keep secrets in the government administration in the 1940s doesn't mean there's never been secrecy before, obviously. Right? States have always tried to keep war tactics secret or diplomatic correspondence secret. The key difference is how do you go about keeping something secret? Uh, until the 1930s and 1940s, the way that the state would try to keep its secrets would be to prosecute the press for publishing them. Right? So in the 1790s, Benjamin Franklin Bash uh, gets secret diplomatic correspondence with the French, and he publishes it in a newspaper, uh, and he finds himself uh, charged and jailed for illegal speech. On the one hand, he's too critical of the government, but on the other hand, he's also published this information that he shouldn't have. He actually will die in jail uh, before it goes to trial from one of the various diseases that runs through Pennsylvania in the late 18th century. Um, during the Civil War, Abraham Lincoln, to try to protect uh, Union military information, will censor newspapers, shut down newspapers, or close the telegraph. Right? So that the way that you deal with secrets is to regulate the press. By the middle of the 20th century, that's no longer politically feasible. First, it's seen as a violation of the First Amendment rights of the press. Second, it's seen as totalitarian. Right? There's a worry that this would make America just like the Nazis that it's fighting. Right? And America is fighting World War II, after all, to preserve freedom of speech and freedom of the press. So during World War II, there's a real problem. How do you keep information secret? And the solution that they hit on is quite ingenious. FDR establishes an office of censorship. But the Office of Censorship has no legal ability to censor the press. Rather, what it does is it issues a code that tells the press, these are the sorts of things we would like you not to publish. It says, if you want to publish them, that's up to you. You might kill a few soldiers, but we're not going to do anything to repress it. They call it voluntary self-censorship. And they basically run schools to encourage journalists to sit on information that they don't want out in the public good. And the system works fairly well during World War II. I just want to give you one example 
1943, the Selective Service Director in Tennessee says that we're building a weapon just down the road that's going to win the war. He's referring to the atomic bomb. Okay, now, during the Cold War, the Atomic Energy Act will keep all information about the bomb classified. Right? This is information that's born classified. You censor it at the source. During World War II, this information is leaked by this director to the press. The press write up the story. It goes to the Associated Press. It goes out to all the newspapers that are uh, subscribed to the Associated Press, and they begin printing their afternoon editions. Right? At 12.23, one of these newspapers calls the Office of Censorship and says, we've got this story. Is this the kind of thing you were talking about that you don't want us to publish? And the Office of Censorship says, actually, yes, that is exactly the sort of thing we don't want you to publish, and sends out a message via the Associated Press to all of the newspapers, can they please kill the story? And despite the fact that they're printing, they do. They remove the story. Right? There's no law, there's no compulsion, and it works fairly well to keep information secret because of the patriotic cooperation of journalists. As the war begins to end, this system is fraying in various ways, and security-minded officials want a stronger and tighter classification system. They're not willing to rely on journalist collaboration anymore. And this leads to the development of a new way to regulate secrets. The Security Advisory Board, those same guys that were trying to train people how to keep secrets, begin writing general classification orders in the late 1940s. And in 1951, in an executive order, Harry Truman will establish for the first time a government-wide classification system. And most importantly, he'll tie it to existing statutes that make it illegal to leak information that's classified to those not authorised to receive them. So for the first time, you've established a new form of censorship, right? a mode of classification that's based not on regulating the circulation of information once it's in the press, but is based on censoring the ability of government officials to release information from the state to the press. Right? It's a different form of classification and securing secrets. And most importantly, it's understood to be entirely compatible with the individual right to free speech because it doesn't interfere with publication, right? That doesn't do anything to newspapers or the expression of opinion. Byron Price, uh, who was the director of the Office of Censorship during World War II, had developed this distinction. Now, he actually was in a speech given in this building, I believe. Uh, he said, uh, free speech does not mean and never has meant the right to play fast and loose with information as distinguished from opinion. We do not curtail, sorry, voluntary censorship does not curtail free speech in that it places no restriction whatever upon expressions of opinion. It seeks only to keep information from the enemy, right? In this distinction, what you get then is the development of a classification system that censors information, but doesn't censor speech, and is therefore seen to be totally compatible with the First Amendment right to press freedom. Uh, Joseph Short, Truman's press secretary, introducing the new classification order in 1951, will say that, quote, classification has no realistic relationship to censorship. Right? Of course, classification is just a different form of censorship. And in some ways, it's a more insidious form. Right? Censorship happens in the public sphere. Someone says something and is then punished for it. You know what they said and you know why they, when they're being punished. Classification keeps information from ever reaching the public sphere. Right? It happens before the press gets the information, before the public can know about it. And the classification system actually is incentivized to overclassify information. If you're working in the government, right, there is no penalty for putting too high a classification stamp on something. There is a penalty for underclassifying a document. Right? So there is a kind of bracket creep, a ratcheting up of more and more information being classified over time. Uh, since the 1950s, there have been Dep Defense Department and intelligence community investigations into the classification system, and uniformly, they say that 75 to 90 percent of the information that's classified should never have been classified in the first place. But despite this fact, the courts continue to defer to the act of classification as it's done within the administration and don't want to force open access to information. So what you get then out of a desire to protect the right to free speech and to free expression is a new form of regulation of information, a new mode of state secrecy. That's the problem. The solution is the development of the freedom of information movement in the 1950s and 1960s. And so the scene in the abstract, when we get the Freedom of Information Act in, the, in 1966 and then in 1974, this can seem like an unprecedented breakthrough for transparency. Uh, I think if you see how quickly and how recently the state secrecy regime had been constructed in the 1940s, FOIA doesn't seem like such a new breakthrough so much as it seems like a weak response to a new problem. Right? The whole idea of a right to know, a right to access information, is first articulated in the 1940s. It's actually first articulated in what are called World Freedom of Information Committees 
uh, that are run by the newspaper industry in the 1940s. And those committees are focused on tearing down Soviet censorship. They're actually international organizations looking at secrecy overseas. And then in 1950, they all realize, actually, there's a problem developing here. And they drop the word world from their title and reform as freedom of information committees at home and advocate for a right to know. Now, most importantly, at first, none of these institutions want a Freedom of Information Act. What they want is a constitutional right to access information. They argue that the First Amendment has to imply the right to access government secrecy, that government secrets is just another form of classification or censorship that should violate the First Amendment. And they kind of cast about for anything that they can do to justify this move. Uh, my favorite moment in this is James Pope, who's the journalist who heads up this organization. He says, you know, John Milton said that we have a right to know, to utter, and to argue freely. And he says, it can't be by accident that he said first the right to know, right? Right to know has to be the most important of these. Uh, these are not arguments that are particularly winning in the courts, right? And so when there's no, ability, no success in constructing a constitutional right to challenge the classification scheme, the freedom of information movement turns to legislative solutions. And the first of these is the Freedom of Information Act of 66, which isn't that successful and is then reformed in the way to Watergate in 1974. Uh, now, the Freedom of Information Act is important and has opened up a lot of information to public oversight, but it's plagued by problems. Just recently, the Associated Press reported that the Obama administration, despite its commitments to being the most transparent administration in history, has actually refused the highest number of uh, FOIA requests in history. In part, that's because there are more FOIA requests being made. Uh, but the point remains, this is a narrow and delimited channel of access. Right? And more importantly, it doesn't challenge the classification system. Right? The second exemption from FOIA says that if the information has been classified, you can't FOIA it. Right? So this is why when you classify old national security documents, a lot of them come redacted, if at all. Um, had the freedom of information movement played out differently, and had it been able to make a constitutional challenge, it, you could have imagined redrafting the classification orders, right? actually making those accountable to a public right to know. As it is, those are entirely autonomous and continue to grow unchecked, and the freedom of information legislation is weak and subsidiary and sort of chips away at it after the fact. Right? It's a sign that uh, what got preserved was not a right of access to information, but a right to free speech. Uh, you can see that, I think, most clearly in the Pentagon Papers case, right? which we all know stands for the principle that if newspapers can publish state secrets, this was the secret documents about the Vietnam War that the New York Times and the Washington Post published. Right? Now, the Supreme Court said that actually you do have a right as a newspaper to publish classified documents, but it only says that you can publish them if you can get them. It doesn't provide any right to get access to them. How did the papers get the documents? Well, they got them from government leakers, Ellsberg and Anthony Rosso in particular. Now, neither Ellsberg nor Rousseau went to jail for leaking. But the reason for that wasn't because the court found they had a right to leak information if it was in the public good. The reason for that was that the Nixon administration had broken into Ellsberg's psychiatrist's office. This was why Nixon founded the plumbers unit. Um, the reason they called the plumbers is because they were fixing leaks. Right? Uh, and they broke into Ellsberg's office, and when the court, Ellsberg's psychiatrist's office, when the court got wind of this, they threw the entire case out for government misconduct. As the law currently stands, there's a balancing act in place. The press can publish secrets if it can get them, but whoever leaks the information to the press violates the law and can go to jail. And you see that playing out with the, you know, while the New York Times wins awards for its WikiLeaks coverage, Chelsea Manning is in jail. Similarly for The Guardian and the Snowden disclosures, right? Snowden has to go into exile because the leak itself is illegal. So we have this kind of balancing act built into the First Amendment that's understood to protect the right to free speech. The press can publish what it wants without interference. But the government's right to censor its own employees remains. And we think of that as a fair balancing act, right? We both want secrets and the right to free speech, and this is a way to weigh them off. But actually, the right to publish is totally dependent on the leaker, right? It's not an even balancing act. It prioritizes the government's right to leak information. And this creates a sequence of problems. In the first case, it makes the press dependent upon officials for access to information, right? Which makes them more inclined to be deferential Right? and also creates possibilities for manipulation. And the textbook example here is the leaks of information about WMD in the lead up to the Iraq war. It also makes it very hard for the public to make sense of newspaper stories based on anonymous tips. Right? When you read a newspaper story in the paper today, it often says three different anonymous sources tell us, and it's very hard to work out what the agenda is. And it also relies that there will always be leakers to come forth with information, and that's just not historically a uh, justifiable assumption. Some things don't leak out. 
Uh, the most famous of these, I think, is the COINTELPRO investigations, right? FBI's illegal monitoring and interference with civil rights and new left activists in the 1960s. And the only reason we know about the COINTELPRO program is that uh, individual activists in Pennsylvania, in a town called Media, appropriately enough, actually broke into the FBI headquarters and stole government documents, right? And from that, the word COINTELPRO appeared for the first time. And once the word COINTELPRO exists, you can then start foyering for many years on the basis of that word and find out the program. But that's a pretty weak protection for the public's right to know and a pretty weak response to unprecedented levels of government secrecy. So that's the second problem. Right? So in both the problems of corporate consolidation and the problems of state secrecy, you see a similar pattern. Right? The growth of a new problem in the 20th century, unanticipated in the language of the First Amendment and unanticipated to the drafters of the First Amendment, an effort to construct a more expansive vision of what a free press could mean, access to government information or diversity of newspapers in the newspaper market, and a failure to implement that vision, largely because of a desire to protect free speech, right, focusing just on limiting censorship of speech rather than guaranteeing these more ambitious goals, but also because of a fear of totalitarianism. Right? In the case of the newspaper industry, uh, a fear that regulating newspaper economics would open the door to government censorship. In the case of classification, fear that allowing national security secrets to circulate would harm national security in the era of the Cold War. The result is that Americans have a very well-respected right and well-protected right to express their opinions. But our rights to access information, our rights to improve the stream of news upon which we base our opinions, are less protected and subject to unprecedented crises in the early 21st century. And I think this story is important for two primary reasons. I think the first is, as I said at the beginning, it recasts our history of the First Amendment. Right? It focuses less on a kind of rising tide of free speech rights at the Supreme Court and more on forgotten visions right, of unanticipated consequences and of the shifting political and economic context in which the right to free speech developed. Right? What it means to have a right to publish without government interference is very different now than it was in the early 20th century. But the idea of a free press as embodied in the First Amendment has never changed. Right? In the uh, 1970s, Thomas Emerson, the leading theorist of the First Amendment, said that the basic theory underlying the First Amendment has remained substantially unchanged since its development in the 17th and 18th century. And I think it's sort of surprising that in the early 21st century, we continue to think about free speech and the free press in exactly the same ways as we thought about them in the late 18th century, despite massive changes in governance, in economics, in society in the 20th century. And secondly, focusing on this paradox, I think, helps explain the crises of the newspaper industry that I began with. A consolidated newspaper industry geared to monopoly profits was poorly suited to shift with the crisis generated by the internet. Right? The response was to try to maintain profit rates, which meant cutting newspapers and reporting. I think what you get then today in the ecology of journalism is still a protection of the right to express your opinion. The blogosphere is better than this at this than any form of media in American history. Right? You can express your opinions in a variety of channels at a low cost without any censorship. Getting access to information upon which to base those opinions is much more difficult. Right? There's been a sequence of studies that show that there's much less reporting going on now. There's much more opinion, opinion blogging than there is new journalism or investigative journalism. And we get, secondly, the blossoming of state secrecy even under the, quote, most transparent administration in history, in large part because earlier mechanisms to regulate the sphere of circulation have completely fallen away, and the only tools left to the Obama administration are to regulate the disclosure of information from within the administration, right, which continues, therefore, to expand in the early 21st century. So in the conclusion to my book, I discuss some of the policy dis uh, discussions that are currently going on about how to confront some of these problems and how we might imagine a more vibrant press freedom in the coming years. I'd be happy to answer the questions about that in question time. Uh, but for now, I just want to suggest the conceptual importance of distinguishing freedom of the news from freedom of speech. Uh, problems of secrecy and corporate consolidation have been with us for a long time. They're not going to go away without a deliberate program of reform. Uh, but current First Amendment orthodoxy focused just on the negative right to free expression uh, is no guide to dealing with these problems. Um, and the hope is, and the challenge now is, that if we focus on public rights to the news, we might be able to reconstruct what an American free press looks like in the coming decades. Thanks for your time. Um,
So my understanding is we have some time for questions, but I've been asked to ask you to head to the microphones on either side so we can hear. Hi. Thank you for your presentation. I found it very interesting. Is the Snowden situation an anomaly or something we'll see a lot more of? Uh, hard to know. Uh, I guess there's two ways to think about that, whether the likelihood of a disclosure uh, is anomalous or likely to exist more often. I'm not sure. Um, you know, as the state requires more and more people to have a security clearance to do their work, uh, you know, four and a half million people now need a security clearance, the oversight process is going to get weaker in some ways. Um, and there's been stories in the Post recently uh, that the private firms contracted to do the security clearances are behind on their quotas and kind of speeding things up, which means that actually there's more chance of individuals uh, getting through, getting security clearances, and then choosing to leak. Um, they still face the risk of losing their jobs, right? losing a security clearance and losing your job. So it's, there's a potential there. There's still the same risk. So it's hard to gauge how any individual will make that decision um, to risk their livelihood uh, for the public good. Um, but the conditions are all there to suggest it will happen more frequently. Uh, and I think the way it's been handled is typical and is likely to happen again, that if you do get leaks, the press will get awards for the publication based on the leaks, but the leaker will face severe prosecutions. Thanks. Hi. Uh, several years ago, I heard a, a somewhat similar talk in which a uh, former newspaper editor said that newspapers do three functions that nobody else does, and you were you dwelled on one of them, uh, almost nobody else does, investigative journalism um, with deep pockets sometimes. Second, um, they are a major institution with, with legal backing, which, these, which individual bloggers like myself are not. And third, they, they amass a readership. I mean, some people take the Washington Post for the bridge column or for the horoscope or whatever, but they do end up reading at least parts of the rest of the paper, and so they amass a readership. And on that third point, of course, with the splintering of the internet, everybody has their own readership and people are reading stuff that they agree with and, and they're not, this, this mass readership isn't being amassed quite the same way. And so I kind of missed at the end what your answer was to those three things, and, and maybe you could repeat it, or, or what is your answer to the fact that nobody's doing those three functions as well now? Yeah, so I think the answer to all of them is slightly different, right? Um, and I think this is the benefit of distinguishing between a right to free speech and a right to information, right? Mm -hmm. So the problems of uh, the decline of a mass media market and the splintering uh, is a problem of collective governance and of sort of having a common culture in which people are reading similar things and have similar talking points and are not in their echo chambers. That's a problem from one angle. On the other hand, uh, the mass press of the mid middle decades of the 20th century wasn't always the most democratic common culture, right? Certain, mm -hmm. around Cold War prerogatives, things were repressed in the public good and having only a few small people, right, responsible for deciding what everybody gets access to mm -hmm. isn't necessarily the best thing. Um, so I think that there's challenges to a more diversified media market, but there are also real opportunities. So I'm less concerned about the decline of people just kind of picking up the news uh, for the bridge columns or the comics and getting the front page or listening to echo chambers than the first problem. And the first problem is how do you support investigative journalism and mm -hmm. reporting? Um, and that's a different problem to how do you make sure there's channels for discussion and debate. Uh, there aren't good solutions at the moment, um, but I think if we focus on propping up investigative journalism and the reporting function rather than everything else a newspaper might do. You can actually see it's not that expensive to hire newsrooms in the grand scheme of things to do reporting, particularly when you don't have to pay for delivery trucks and newsprint and like the labor costs of a larger newspaper. So what can be done? There are a few different options on the table at the moment. There are investigations into using nonprofit law to allow newspapers to incorporate as sort of nonprofit ventures. Mm -hmm. There is philanthropic investment in newspapers to kind of establish them on endowments in the equivalent to the university. And less debated in the US, but I think also appropriate, you could imagine publicly endowing investigative newsrooms, um, something on like the BBC model, but targeted not at opinion columns and not at sort of soft coverage, but just at the kind of pro publica model of individual organizations devoted to gathering news. Now, you don't want all of those to be government funded, right? That creates a certain set of problems of its own. But some of those alongside philanthropically endowed uh, papers, and you know, given how much cheaper it is today, it's also possible to imagine uh, consumer-based, subscription-based uh, 
reporting organizations. So that would be my answer, uh, to focus on that problem, not the broader problems of disaggregation. Hi. Hi. I, I want to thank you. Um, again, I'm not from the United States of America. I'm from the Caribbean. I grew up in the Netherlands. So this leads to a few questions uh, based on what you have to say. And uh, obviously, if you grew up in the Netherlands, um, at least when I was there, um, in the, you touch on it, but uh, you didn't go too far in it. The, the fact that uh, anybody who reads the, uh, the papers in the United States, it, it becomes very apparent if you come from anywhere else, how very, very, very limited what is reported here. I mean, it's extreme and extraordinarily limited, right? Very little about foreign news, very little about, uh, you know, about what's going on from different angles. So that's, that's, that's the first problem. Uh, and how do you see what you talked about playing into that or, or, or manifesting that in, in worse ways? The second uh, issue is that you talk about the fact that the newspapers are facing growing problems because of, of, of um, growing government secrecy with um, getting information from government, right? But one of your talks was the fact that uh, the media is part of a corporatized media system, right? What about the problem of the media getting information from these big, massive uh, businesses that dominate our, you know, in a neoliberal model that dominates society, right? Where, because it's a kind of a free market type of thing, it makes it much more difficult even to go after that, right? So that's a, a, another big problem. And the third issue, obviously, you come from, uh, I believe you come from Australia, right? Mm -hmm. um, to, to somewhat compare and contrast, right? Uh, do you see these same things uh, starting to develop in Australia? Do you see the government in Australia moving also in, in a direction of saying, oh, you know, you could write whatever you want, you could have whatever opinions you want, the only problem is you're not going to get it, right? Is this a development that you see taking place internationally? Or do you see, for example, in Europe, you know, with, with the European uh, court system and stuff like that, um, these, different, th these things playing out differently in different places, given the ideological and, you know, and uh, their political backgrounds? Thank you. Great. So the final question about the sort of comparative, the comparative question about how distinct the US is. I, I won't speak to Australia in particular because I haven't been there uh, for a long time. Uh, you know, I'm based here now. Um, so I'm not, despite my accent, I'm not an expert on Australian media. I'll say what's distinctive about the United States uh, is actually the right to free speech is so highly protected. Right? So in these other places, there is a right, uh, there are evolving secrecy regimes. Um, but those tend to look more like the earlier moment in the US, right, where the press gets access to the information. So in France, for instance, uh, you know, when you're doing research on classified information, you normally can get access to it. You then have to sign an agreement that you won't publish it. Um, that's a different model that's closer to the World War II model than it is to the American model, which doesn't want to do anything to interfere with free speech rights and has to construct secrecy in a different way. Uh, the broader economic crises are the same elsewhere. Uh, but in other countries, it's more imaginable to use public dollars to prop up journalism because there's not the same fear that any state involvement will interfere with the First Amendment. Um, as for the first two questions, um, the problem for both of them is a problem of dollars, right? Uh, how, do you get the inf how do you get the money to do investigative reporting on sort of corporate stories in the, in the corporate sector? And how do you get the money to do international reporting? Uh, and the crises of newspaper economics in the US has undercut both of those missions. Um, the final problem, I think, on the corporate side is that it would be fine, I mean, it would be better if the papers did investigative journalism into corporate malpractice. Um, but one would probably settle for like a halfway house and say, at least do no harm in the first instance. And the real problem is that with slash, slashing uh, newsroom budgets, more and more reporting is basically rewrites of handouts. Um, and a lot of that is corporate propaganda, right? Handouts coming from corporations into newsrooms, advertising a new product that then is an easy way to write up a story that people will hit on. I mean, the classic is all the iPhone stories. Every time that gets released, that's a leading news story, right? That's really advertising running in the news columns. And that's even leaving to one side the problem of native advertising where newspapers are actually selling their white space to corporations for profit. So I think in both cases, uh, the problem is trying to do more with less produces a kind of weaker, uh, less of a watchdog news function. Um, and in that sense, my sen I think actually that's a kind of global trend. Uh, it's a real problem. What makes it distinctive in the US is the absolute right to free speech. Hi, Eric. <laughs>
Hi, how are you? Uh, thank you, Dr. Lubavick. Uh, actually, I have one, I'm a history guy, so can we go back to the 30s, if you don't mind? Um, I actually have a quick question. You said at the National Archives you found letters uh, discussing the New Deal proposals uh, about constituents and Americans advocating uh, Congress not to pass these three proposals, those New Deal reforms. I'm wondering what are the motivations behind Americans at the time? Are like New Deal era newspapers openly advocating uh, against like antitrust legislation? And uh, why would a normal Americans, for instance, feel inspired enough to align themselves with uh, newspaper barons. Okay. Um, so the letters tend not to come from the general public. Uh, the letters tend to come from small, well, I mean, they come in various forms, uh, but they tend to come from publishers or from spokespeople from publishers. Um, there are letters from individual members of the public, and they sort of spray across the issue, depending on their own politics. So some of them who love the New Deal are like, I can't believe you're getting such a raw deal in the corporate press, and others who hate the New Deal think that FDR is a dictator and that they're proud of the press for standing up to them. So there's a kind of broad spray on those issues. Um, you know, I guess the more important point for us is that this is a real debate in the 1930s. Uh, people are very upset with the newspaper coverage of the New Deal. Uh, when FDR is re-elected in 36, uh, you know, all the newspapers had come out really opposed to his re-election. The night that he wins, uh, protesters on the streets of Chicago actually egg the Chicago Tribune building and set fire to delivery trucks. Right? There's an idea here that this is a fight against the Chicago Tribune. And people write in to cancel their subscriptions to the Tribune because of its biased coverage. Uh, you know, there's a sense here that the newspapers uh, were very much a conservative force in American politics. Um, we think a lot today about sort of the mainstream media, right, the lamestream media, as the liberal media. Uh, that's a really new development in the 1960s and 1970s. In the 1920s, 30s, and 40s, the expectation is that there is a mainstream media, and if it's a force in society, it's a conservative force. It's big business. It's on the wrong side of the tracks against the people. Um, and something very interesting happens in the 50s that switches that. Uh, historians are still trying to work that out, um, but the best guesses are that it has something to do with uh, newspaper coverage of the civil rights movement, and particularly when the New York Times belatedly starts sending correspondence to the South that this is seen as kind of a new moment of a national news media that's opposed to kind of states' rights and conservative values. Um, but it's a complicated story what the average person thinks about all of this. Okay, I think uh, we're out of time. So thank you very much for coming. Uh, it's been a real pleasure.